I'm excited. You guys feel God yet? Seriously. Felt God, right? Amen? Y'all look a little tired. Y'all right this morning? You need some coffee? What? Whew. Well, this morning I want to talk about um, the love of God and how it, it chases you, how it forms you, how it, um, when, when God enters a life, the change that's produced by that. Amen? I kind of started a journey the past couple weeks. Um, I, I got in an odd conversation with a friend um, probably weeks ago now, maybe even a month, and we were talking about the SCOTUS ruling, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States. I just like to say SCOTUS makes me feel like I'm smart. And um, the, obviously that, that same-sex marriage was legalized um, nationally. And I got really nervous because um, I got licensed as a pastor. This is actually my first sermon as a pastor. So all that means is I go longer now. It just adds time on the end of the message because I have four endings instead of three now. That's all that really happens. Um, I also can bury and marry you, which I don't know why I'm more excited to bury than marry, but don't worry about that. <laughs> it's for some odd reason, that just appeals to me more. I don't know. But I, I started to talk about this with my college group. Um, and I started just, just asking them questions of what their opinion was about it. I was like, well, what do you guys think? What, what happens in your world? I, I'm not in your campuses. I'm not in your lives. And I kind of got the same responses from them as I did with my youth students. So I talked to my youth students next, and I said, guys, this happened. What do you guys know this happened, number one? And what do you think about this happening, number two? And, and then I started pulling my friends. So really, if you're my friend in this room, you've been pulled, and you're part of this sermon, so thank you. For your feedback, and um, the session went really well. But um, I, I just start forming. What, what, what do we look at? What do we think as, as a Christian community, as my college students, as my youth students, as my Christian friends, about this ruling? And all it kept coming, arriving back to, is, well, it's sin. We're a blanket sin, and, and it's a choice. We're coming down to choice, and we're coming down to sin. We've kind of blanketed that, right? We kind of just say, well, the sin's the blanket of it, and, and Bryce said it really well, the one sermon he did. He said, it's the world being the world, and the church needs to be the church. But I wasn't satisfied with that answer at all. Um, I didn't like it. I mean, what I heard a lot of people saying and what I was reading in all the articles was a lot of pointing out sin after sin, and, and we're pointing as if saying that, that the sin that, that I'm standing in, and I was saying this, the sin that I'm standing in is fine, but the sin that they're standing in isn't. And I didn't like that. I, I didn't like that because it was unsettling. It was, it was trying to say that somehow I was better because I understood that I was a sinner. Right? It's kind of like, oh, well, well I sin, and, and so it's better because I recognize that but you need to recognize that and fix it, right? That's kind of what we go at, right? We'll fix it. It's a choice. It's a sin. Get over it. Move on. Come to Jesus, right? That, that doesn't sit well with me. And I'm not saying that there, it's like a blanket. I was talking to the same friend, and we were talking about economics or finance or something about the stock market. I kind of got confused in the conversation, but I understood this part of it. If say everything crashes and the bank only allows you to pull out 60 bucks, Every one of your income levels just got equal. You have 60 bucks, you have 60 bucks, and you have 60 bucks, right? And no matter if I have a million dollars in the bank, I can't access it. We all of a sudden are on a level playing field because everything crashed and I can only pull out 60 bucks. That's exactly God's view on sin. It's a level playing field. You're always sitting in the same playing field in the same situation. It's a blanket. God views it all the same. And, and I don't like that I got on the judgmental side. And, and as a broader topic, I wanted to talk about as Christians, as the church, how do we respond? And, and that's kind of the question I was looking at. What is Jesus' view on sin? And you're like, well, Josh, that's really easy. He doesn't like it. He killed his son over it. Right? You're sitting there going, is he really going to take 30 minutes to talk to me about something that I understand? And I hope not. Because I don't know if I understood it, to be honest. I think the question is what brings up, and, and I went, and how do we as Christians minister to it? How do we minister to a culture that is so saturated and a world that they don't even know is sinful? They don't even know that they need to change. You didn't have the, the power to change before you had the choice to, so sitting there, you can't look at them and go, play by my rule book. This rule book is what follows, all right? It's what we live by, right? Play by my book. You never read the book. So how do you know to play by it? 
I, I'd love to step on a football field and play, but I guarantee you I'd be out in a second because I don't know the rule book. I just know that I'm angry, want to flush out my anger and, and tackle you. But I'd probably do it way out of bounds and probably end up hurting someone, honestly. And then the, the second question comes up of can we live a sinless life? If I'm looking at you and saying, well, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm struggling and I'm going through sin, but you don't, and they're looking at you going, well, then if you can't beat it, how can I? That's a fair turnaround question if I've ever heard one. Well, if you can't give me hope, then why am I following you? What, what kind of hope is that, right? And so I think this sums up in the questions found in love. I found this picture on Facebook. It says, love one another. But what if they're immigrants or gay or poor? Jesus goes, did I stutter? I'd love for that to be our banner. Did he stutter? It says, love one another. And so I've heard many times, and I think we're inundated in church so much to go, you're sinful, you're sinful, you're sinful. Repent, 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 repent. And I think we as Christians put up with so much because that's what we hear and the world walks through those doors and they sit there in that chair and they hear, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But, but we rarely come around to the other side of it. We rarely come around to circumvent why they're wrong. We just point out that you're wrong, like somehow, because I'm wrong, you're wrong, we're all wrong, so get right. I don't understand that. It didn't settle right when we're talking about a sinful choice in our culture. And I've been through so many emotions with this topic. I've been through judgment. I've been through compassion. I wanted to believe that somehow God made someone gay because then, then I know that then somehow it's right and, and, and we can get somewhere, right? Because then there's an answer then. Then there's an answer to an alcoholic or an addict. Oh, you're born that way so you can't help it. So then I can come alongside you and just raise you up. And I, and I want that to be the case and and so I'm going through all this compassionate, and I'm reading up scriptures. So then I turn to the Bible. I'm talking to my college students. I said, well, I should probably be prepared in my view, right? If I'm leading you in a discussion, I want you to have a biblical view. So I need to be prepared in mind. And I got into Romans, and, and through these two weeks, my college kids are firing verses at me. My friends are firing verses at me. They're like, what about this? What about this? What do I say here? It says this. It says that it's a sin. Look, this is how we need to respond. And I got to Romans 1, and I'm going to turn to Romans 1, 25, and it's going to the end. It says, Romans 1, 25, starting in 25. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen? That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the woman turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty it deserves. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. And let them do the things that should have never been done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. I thought that was funny. It says disobey their parents. Like, that's like an immortal thing. You hear that, kids? They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do it too. We're going to hit the pause button. All right, pause that. We're coming back. Got me? I believe that the worst thing that could happen in the child of God is that they get away with their sin. Sin destroys, sin corrupts, and sin separates us from a relationship with God. But the most hopeful thing I could think of is that God will not let us get away with our sin. Amen? He always confronts us and he always chases us. The best place Christians are so likened to sheep in the Bible. You've probably heard that so many times. And then the shepherd is related to Jesus, and the shepherd has a staff, and it has a curve on it. And you have seen, I was trying to find one in our church. We don't have one, so if you have one at home, bring one in so I can use it. You have a shepherd's staff, and the, the shepherd would put it across his lap. And if a sheep would particularly run away from the flock, 
The shepherd would go out and get it and bring it back and say, no, you need to stay here, buddy. He's a rebellious sheep. He's dressed in leather, and he's all like, no, I don't need to follow the man. And he's running away, and the shepherd's like, no, come back. But he does it again, and you have this sheep that keeps running away, keeps rebelling. So what the shepherd does is he sits down, puts his, his staff across his lap. He takes a little lamb dressed in leather and breaks his leg over his staff. He then puts it on his back and carries it around until it's healthy again. That sheep learns that I should probably stay with the group. And he probably lost the leather. All bedazzled, what I can picture it in my head. God does that to his children. Hebrews 12, 7 through 11 says, As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you're illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us. So we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. I heard a wise guy say one time, you want to know how you know you're saved? If God still disciplines you. Think about it. If you're always getting away with your sin, and this isn't a heavy sermon, I promise it gets lighter. This just kind of starts heavy. It took me a lot of prayer to get through this intro because I know myself. I know who I am, and I know what I want to do once I get off the stage. So for me to get up here and go, well, just fix your sin, is a little judgmental of the guy standing here, right? I mean, seriously, you're allowed to say yes. You're not going to offend me because I know that. But what I want to understand is if there's got to be a maintenance in our life, if there's got to be a reason for God to discipline us, then we should enjoy it. Because we know that our Father in heaven is refining us into something better. If he points out something in your life that he doesn't necessarily agree with, that's a good thing. Then you know you're on the right track. If you haven't been pointed out to in a long time, why not? What happened? Did something walk away or or something fall apart? Because that's how we know God loves us. That's how we know our Father loves us. It's through a discipline. I said God never lets us get away with our sin. I was looking at David, the life of David. And if you know anything about David, he was called a a guy after God's own heart. And the story goes a little bit like this. David was walking around on his roof one day, saw a lady bathe, and was like, hey, what's up? I'm the king. I'm going to go fetch her. Sends his little minion, gets Bathsheba. They hang out. Hang out. Anyway, produces a child. One problem, Bathsheba was married. So David's like, oh no, how do I fix this? Goes, sends her husband to war. So he's at war, excuse me, but Uriah is at war. Says, hey Uriah, you need to come back home. You leave all your soldiers there. I kind of hung out with your wife, so I need you to hang out with your wife so I can fix my problem. Uriah comes back from war and he goes, I can't go hang out because my soldiers are fighting. I'm supposed to lead them, but I'm sitting here. So he never went home. So David goes, oh no, what do I do now? And so he goes, well, I'll just send you to get killed. Sends Uriah out into the front lines of battle. Uriah ends up dying. Bathsheba and David marry. Problem solved, right? Well, God sent a prophet named Nathan to confront David about his sin. And Nathan tells the story to David about, it's a, it's a story that, that appeals to David's justice and righteousness. It was ingrained in David. And he tells the story about a rich landowner who wanted to have a meal for a house guest. And he wanted to kill a lamb, but, but there was a poor guy that had a lamb too, and, and this lamb was awesome. He actually clothed it in good clothes, and he raised it. This poor guy raised his little pet, kind of like a dog, I guess, but from a little, little lamb, from a little ooh. And raised it up. And the rich man, instead of killing his own lambs, who had many of, took the poor man 
and, and killed the poor man's lamb. And then the poor dude's like crushed, right? The family pet just died. And, and, the, and Nathan goes, David, what should happen in this situation? And David goes, well, that, that rich man needs to die. That rich man needs punished for what he did. And Nathan looks right at David and goes, you're the rich man. See, David took what only one thing he had. David had many wives. David had anything he wanted. He was the king and ended up taking what belonged to Uriah. And Psalm 51 was penned right after Nathan confronted David. And this is what it says. I'm going to read it off my paper. And this is the end New Living Translation. It's new into my life. I really like it. I recommend it. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sins is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. David realized his sin and confessed it immediately. Nathan's words shocked David into repentance. On pause. Romans 2. This is where it gets good. 1 through 4. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say that you are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? This is where it could. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. The answer to this culture is infectious love. The answer to a lot of our, our pinpointing out, I realized I was standing there, and I was standing in a position that was the opposite of love. I'm sitting in a chair having, having discussions with college students, having discussions with my youth group, having discussions with my friends, and it keeps coming around to, why is my sin right but theirs isn't? Why can I not look past what they blatantly don't know about? It's love. God says, don't you understand what my loving kindness and patience brought you to repentance? It doesn't say that because Josh Green walked up to me and said that because you profess to, to love another guy that you're not sinful, that's what brought me to repentance. It didn't say because my view and the judgment into your life is what brought them into repentance. It says that God himself, when God shows up into a life, that loving kindness infiltrates out through us and brings about a repentance. It's what happened to David. Nathan shows up and says, dude, you're the rich man. Immediately, David's reminded of the goodness of God and goes, oh no. How did I let my life sit here for so long? I killed a man. I hung out. I thought I was just hanging out. And all of a sudden, he remembers the goodness of who God is, and that turned his whole life around. That's what changes our culture. There should be a change everywhere you walk based upon the goodness and grace because of God in your life. Amen? There should be a visible excitement. People should look at you and know they can walk up to you and find love in your life. That that goodness of God infiltrating out through your life is gonna, someone's going to look at that. Someone's going to see it, and they're going to go, oh my goodness, I need that. That's what I need. I don't need someone pointing out why I'm wrong. A judge can do that for you. Go ahead and just speed down Route 84 here, right past that church that got me. You'll find out real quick, real quick, why you was wrong, and it had nothing to do with God. The goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. Church, I know I keep saying this. This literally blew my mind a little bit because I realized, one, the maintenance I haven't done. I like to snap right to you're guilty, you're wrong, you're judged because what it does is protect me. Man, what that does is say, man, at least I know I'm okay. 
at least I know I'm forgiven, at least I know that I'm okay, and if I can point out how you're wrong, I'm not that bad, so then at least I know I'm okay still. It's a wall mechanism that, man, just like a steel wall girds right up. And I'm not saying that your sin's okay. I'm not saying that love is going to just excuse away a lifestyle, but actually I am. When God's love enters your life, when that love that is so radical that you're reminded of who you once were. First Corinthians lists all those sins again. Homosexuality, drunkenness, yada, 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 yada. It goes, oh yeah, you were once this person. Have you forgotten that you were once this person? Because I did. I forgot I was that person all of a sudden. I forgot I was the one that, that didn't understand love, that didn't know I had a choice before I had a choice. I didn't realize the love of God, and that didn't pour out of my life. God's plan is so much bigger than sin. Amen? God's plan is so much bigger than you can ever imagine. And when God walks up on you, your whole life should change. And then when he enters into you and his Holy Spirit's living in you, all of a sudden, all of your decisions kind of get filtered through again. That's when we have the beginning to choose. Do I want to go back to where I was? Or do I want to go back to who I need to be? And then that infiltration of the goodness of God is what reminds you of, oh, yeah, this is where I need to be. This is who God is. This is where I need to walk. Amen? God's plan is so much bigger for who you are. This, mus- this message is not let your sin off the hook. It reminds you that we are all the same level. We all struggle. We all fail. But God is always ready and willing and aiming to bring us back to his heart. There's no amount of yelling that's going to bring someone around. The SCOTUS rolling isn't going away. It's only actually going to get worse. All right? And when I say worse, it's because I fear a lot of people with the Jesus is my Savior shirts on are going to pick up the hate flag and run around and bash people with it. Instead of loving them back around into the kingdom and learning that, you know what? I once was that person. I might not have been blatantly this, or I might not have struggled with that, or I might never resemble that, but at least I can give them the love of God that I know changed my life and can change their life. I fear that we're going to have a separation in the body of Christ against love and against hate. And those those Jesus is my Savior folks are going to go, oh, look, we have the Bible. You know what? I have it too. And every verse that lists a bunch of sin, you know what the next verse says? And then God loved me. Amen? And then God loved me. I have such a fear in me that we're going to turn hateful in the name of Scripture because it says that, that they burned and God let them in abandonment. We're going to hate people into hell instead of love them into the kingdom. That scares me. I don't want to be that pastor. I don't want to be that guy when a gay couple comes up into the community and goes, hey, so we want to get married. Of course I'm going to say no, but how do I do it in love? right? How do, we, how do we finally minister to that? How do we finally stop just going, oh, you're wrong, and kick him out? How can we let him sit here with us and let him sit next to you and go, you know what, man? I'm just like you. My sin hurts too, man. I'm struggling just like you. Sit down. Let's figure it out together. The church's job isn't condemning. The church is teaching and loving. When you sit in here, are you a representation of love or are you a representation of what a speeding ticket can give you? Do you understand what love of God has done for you? Man, am I scared. I hope you guys can understand that. That's why I struggled with the, oh man, I don't like that answer because then that means my sin's okay and theirs isn't. That's why I didn't like that answer because I literally was leaving out the love of God in my life. I literally was like, oh no. Oh no. All right, worship team. I want to end in a quote. It says, disciples of Christ are lovers. The greatest proof of our discipleship will never be our dogmatic adherence to some doctrine or the great deeds we do in Jesus' name, but rather our love for one another. By this, John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Our love for each other is in fact the only proof we have to show the world that God is real and the gospel is true. Let us choose to abide in his word, press on their fruitfulness, and walk in his love so that the world will know that we are his disciples and many will turn to him. This is why Jesus came and it is why we are here. Bringing the lost into the kingdom of God is the main thing. When we forget 
that bringing the lost into the kingdom of God is the main thing. That's when judgment is overriding our pew instead of the grace of Jesus Christ. When we forget who we were and the person standing next to us is just like us, amen, bro, come on. That's when we lose the sight of what God did in our life. I struggled a long time on how to end this sermon. I was like, man, it's kind of rolled like we're but it's really simple. There's kind of two things here. One, is there any maintenance that needs to happen? And two, does a, does a viewpoint need to change? I'm not saying that my entire life has changed, but I'm saying my viewpoint on people has changed. I look at them a little differently now. I don't see what I used to, and I don't immediately start judging them. Me and my friend in college used to say, I'm majoring in communications and I'm minoring in judgment. <laughs> I love to people watch, and I love to pinpoint what's wrong with you by watching you. That's called judging. <laughs> Sorry. But what I want you to remember is the goodness of God in your life, that, that what brought you into repentance is what brings the lost into his kingdom. And that church is the main thing. That's why I want Brook Hills, that's what I want the banner of this place to be is love. That's what I want when you walk in these doors to know that no matter what I'm walking through, no matter what I'm struggling with, I know that I'm going to find people here that I can talk to that aren't going to be judgmental of what I did. They're just going to help me bring back into the kingdom of God. God's chasing you. God's passionate about you. Man, I heard him saying that standing right there. That's why I sat down. God is passionate about you, and he wants your life, and he wants your soul.